right here, this is a little reader um, that includes a selection of texts. Um, and this, this reader we're going to start distributing online as well. It includes interviews that I've done with people, uh, Regine Basha, Celine Comparelli, Burak Gellier, who's here. Um, we have a couple. Annika Erickson, Carrie Young, Katya Sander. It also includes texts by people who will come in the program, and then maybe tomorrow, Matteo Pasquinelli. There's a text to visit here. Joshua Simon, who will join us in mid April for a program. So if you're interested in reading any of these texts, we're going to start distributing this for free as a PDF online. But we're going to update it regularly. So we'll update it next week and another week. It's, it's always kind of incomplete. And we're also going to have a uh, a physical version like this available in SALT Research in the Galata building. So when you go to Galata to check out the Piracy Project, also look for this project and you'll see some uh, contributions in that form. But, yeah, okay, I think we're ready. I think we'll go ahead and hear from Roland. Thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. So uh, my name is Laurel Patak, and uh, I just wanted to say, first off, uh, big thanks to Joseph for the invitation and to SALT for hosting this. Um, and I think my presentation is really apt in follow-up to Ava's, um, and also in follow-up to the really uh, great dialogue that you guys initiated um, during the Q&A. So, uh, you know, where Ava is coming from the point of view of an artistic practice and how it negotiates these questions and ideas, um, I want to explain sort of the work that I do as someone very interested in similar ideas and themes, but who takes it up from the point of view of a curatorial practice. Um, and I think, you know, that is interesting um, from the start because I think the idea of an artist sets up very specific expectations around authorship, where the idea of curating feels to me like it um, has blurrier ideas about what's at stake in authorship. And, for me, curatorial practice is always um, a kind of collective practice. There are so many people involved in the things that I do um, that I have to acknowledge it that way. And part of my work um, making exhibitions and projects is to kind of think about uh, how to bring that collectivity to the fore in various ways. Um, I just want to tell you a few details about my background before I leap into my presentation, because I think they really frame the way that I think about the things that I do. Um, I'm working now as a curator at Tensta Kunstwall in Stockholm, um, and this is, you know, a proper art space. We have material artworks and exhibitions on view. Um, but the interesting thing about my own background is that I became a curator more or less by accident, <laughs> and that happened by running a blog, which I did for five years. Um, and that was a project that really explored contemporary image-based practices and tried to self-reflexively consider, if not sort of invent on its own terms, what the idea of an online curatorial practice could mean. Um, and I bring that up from the start because I think part of the kind of anxiety and questions around property and ownership um, that we're dealing with today have a lot to do with the advent of online culture and the immaterialization of cultural products. Um, because um, those kind of set up a different terms of negotiation around these questions that we didn't have for a long time when culture was material and fixed and the terms of owning something were more or less clear. Um, so, I, I mean, I started this kind of online project to just share the work of, of artists that I found to be interesting um, or inspiring in different ways, and I meant it very much as a kind of personal project that very quickly became public. And that made me have to negotiate um, what the internet was as a kind of space. Um, it was a place where um, I was constantly bombarded with questions and suggestions and artists, you know, wanting to be in dialogue about things with me. And it really struck me that it was um, a place where you could think about a curatorial practice maybe in slightly different terms. Um, and the context, you know, for, for why I wanted to do a project like that in the first place came from working um, in New York City for, um, by then, many years in the culture industry there. And I think I felt increasingly critical about it as a very commercial context for art because I started to feel like the kinds of things that the 
the system that was most available there made possible were um, problematic and not always the things that I was interested in. So I started to really um, try and think through these relationships between the online and the offline, the immaterial and the material, and to try and kind of you know pay attention to the notions of value and production and exchange and property and ownership that each of these models embodied. Um, it's maybe also good to just note, um, as a side note, before I even started working culture, in the time when I graduated from college, it was the same, it was kind of the end of the dot-com boom in New York. And that basically meant that any young person could find an extremely well-paying job to sort of invent the internet. Um, and finance capital was being flooded into this um, kind of new development, but no one really understood what it was yet. Um, and I, I always like to point out that, you know, my very subjectivity as an adult was really formed under these conditions, which um, have very kind of specific economic um, and social set of relations tied to them. So uh, I'll start here. <laughs> this is actually um, a picture of a uh, book reading and signing that happened in Second Life in 2006. And uh, this is a book that was published by a very infamous law professor and internet age legal theorist, um, Lawrence Lessig, who has been very involved in the conversation around intellectual property rights. Um, and I just think that this uh, is a kind of perfect provocation to start with. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, I really, Joseph has sort of set up the terms of thinking about the question of free um, in this series that he's doing here in his research here. Um, and I guess I just wanted to say that first and foremost for me, um, this idea of free is, I think, a large scale cultural destabilization of the very notion of value as we've come to know it, and that the terms of how you own something, how you make something, how you exchange something, have then obviously also um, changed in relationship to this. So, uh, I mean, I really see all of this as being so much mobilized by online culture. Um, and so I, I wanted to try and kind of think about the online culture version of free culture um, and ask us to kind of make sense of it here. Um, and just to kind of give you a brief, very brief one sentence synopsis of, of what Lessig is interested in, his argument here in, in this book is that he is trying to point out that the legal and economic environment stifles the kind of progress um, of art and science, and that's exactly the opposite of the, pur the purpose in the United States Constitution for why we would think about ownership in a certain way. Um, I think it's also interesting just to kind of add here that Second Life itself, which I mean, I, uh, I don't know what its status is these days, but at least when it kind of felt like this new novel cultural invention, um, I think it was really a kind of training ground for us culturally to try and rethink ideas of value and property and how we could transport our kind of older material ideas of those things into online space and test them out in different ways. And then I think that we also have to remember that uh, Second Life was one of the first kind of online projects to invent its own currency, which I think was called Linden Dollars or something like this. And that that currency actually eventually took on like, you know, actual value and could be exchanged or at least um, calculated according to how monetary value was calculated. Um, but I also wanted to return us to a kind of earlier moment of thinking about what it means to make culture free. Um, and so this is a representation of the Louvre, uh, the muse infamous museum in Paris. And I just wanted to um, kind of bring this up as maybe the most obvious example, but to, to talk about, you know, that culture being free has, something, has been something that's been mobilized many times in many cultures, in many contexts, and for many different reasons. Um, and I was kind of interested in just bringing up this in passing as a kind of reminder of you know, another moment in time where uh, art and culture were to be made free. Um, and this is a museum that was, of course, founded during the French Revolution. 
Um, and what the idea behind this was is that a private palace would thus be turned into a public museum. And so here you see material production like painting and sculpture um, are mobilized to embody and symbolize the transition from a monarchy to a democracy. So here the state is interested in offering the idea of generosity and free culture. And why does it do this? Well, because it's interested in the production of citizenship and it finds art and culture as one mode available to it to do so. Um, and so then from there, I guess I thought maybe we could think a little bit about the context of salt. Um, and this is a basic kind of foundation of the inquiry that Joseph set up and asked um, us to respond to tonight, which is that salt is a cultural institution that is essentially made free by a bank. And what does that mean? And is that a kind of contemporary gesture that we can parallel to the gesture of the Louvre, but where the state doesn't seem interested in doing this anymore, but it's more the corporation? Um, and how do we kind of think about and understand that? Um, you know, because SALT, as I understand it, is, um, tra has transformed a private bank building into a public space for art. Can we think about that in relationship to the palace becoming the museum? Um, and it's not that I mean to say here by any means that uh, one model is better than another, and I think both of them instrumentalize art and culture in various ways and for various agendas. Um, but I think one difference that might be pointed out about what it means for kind of the state to mobilize that versus the corporation is to think about the idea that, um, you know, as a citizen, whether you like it or not, you know, you have a kind of civic and through taxes even a financial um, obligation then to this kind of site of culture. And you are very deeply invested in it in a way that I would say <coughs> might be different than what happens um, or how one feels towards, you know, responsibility or agency towards the corporation if we're to make, to believe in this parallel that I'm trying to, to draw. Um, and I guess I also wanted to just think a little bit about the difference between the Louvre and this sort of very material form of, um, of art and culture um, versus the kind of contemporary context of salt, which I find very interesting that, um, you know, primarily, how, as I understand salt, how it explains what it's interested in, is that it's interested in um, supporting research, and it's interested in supporting, um, you know, an event like this, which is a form of communication, which is not an object. Um, and I think that that's really interesting to think that, you know, maybe in a contemporary context, what the bank wants to support is much more immaterial production. Um, and I think that that is very kind of deeply embedded in this sort of shift, shift the shifts that the internet has brought about for us. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to read you this quote. This is, I just think this is one of the most brilliant kind of um, assessments of this relationship between art and finance that I've read anywhere. So I'm just going to read you a really short excerpt from a text by David Graeber, who's a really interesting um, kind of anarchist anthropologist who's been looking at questions of value really from an uh, anthropological point of view for a long time. Um, and he published a book last year that was on the subject of debt, which is really great and I would highly recommend. But this um, is just a kind of really small um, bit that he has published in a text called The Sadness of Post-Workerism. And uh, he's, in this text, he's really primarily talking about um, a conference about immaterial labor that happened, by, uh, that was um, produced by the Tate and, in London. Um, and he's very kind of critical of, of the ideas that were presented there. But then he goes into this great diatribe in the middle of this text, and I just wanted to share this with you. I mean, it's really him trying to make this connection and ask the question of why financiers or banks might be so interested in art in the first place. And this is what he says. Quote, contemporary art holds out a special appeal to financiers, I suspect, because it allows for a kind of short circuit in the normal process of value creation. It is a world where the mediations that normally intervene between the proletarian world of material production and the airy heights of fictive capital are essentially yanked away. 
Ordinarily, it, what, it is the working class world in which people make themselves intimately familiar with the uses of welding gear, glue, dyes, and sheets of plastic, power shot saws, thread, cement, and toxic industrial solvents. Mm -hmm. It is among the upper class, or at least the upper middle class world, where even economics turns into politics, where everything is impression management and things really can become true because you say so. Because these two worlds lie, between these two worlds lie endless tiers of mediation. Factories and workshops in China and Southeast Asia produce clothing designed by companies in New York, paid for with capital invested on the basis of calculations of debt, interest, anticipation of future demand, and market fluctuations. In Bahrain, Tokyo, and Zurich, repackaged into an endless variety of derivatives, futures, options, various, trade, various traded and arbitrated and repackaged again onto even greater levels of mathematical abstraction to the point where the very idea of trying to establish a relation with any physical product, good, or services is simply inconceivable. Yet the same bankers and traders who produce these complex financial instruments also like to surround themselves with artists, people who are always busy making things, a kind of imaginary proletariat assembled by finance capital, producing unique products out of, for the most part, very inexpensive materials, objects, and financiers can baptize, consecrate through money, and thus turn into art, thus displaying its ability to perform the basis of materials into objects worth far, far more than gold. So I think you know the point that Graeber makes here that I find to be really interesting is that um, like um, <coughs> like you know banks or financiers, art has also been a site where this kind of testing and becoming a kind of playground for value has happened over time. And I would say that you can also think about the internet and online culture as another site where in the last decades we've really been testing these questions of value. So from there, I kind of wanted to just leap into a few projects, um, curatorial projects that I've worked on that I think contextualize my thinking around some of these <laughs> questions at stake in different ways. Um, first, I'd like to introduce a project that I did in New York, at a space called Art in General, and this was a project called Free Kevin. And the idea here was to think about how one could sort of take these ideas of free culture, peer-to-peer -peer exchange that happened in the online world that I was very interested in, and how could you kind of bring those or import those into the art world, which had very different relationships in my mind to questions of ownership, exchange, etc. So um, what I decided to do was, a, well, I guess I should mention that at the time, this project came out of a larger research that I got really interested in around um, the idea of the hacker as a kind of cultural figure. So what this is a picture of is a protest in New York City in 1999, and these are young hackers outside a court building, and they're protesting the arrest of Kevin Mitnick, who is uh, this guy, <laughs> who was at the time um, the most wanted uh, computer hacker um, in the United States history. Anyway, I don't want to go into the details of the legal case against him, but the uh, basic narrative was that a lot of people thought that he was framed for kind of hacking into information systems and supposedly stealing data that was very important and expensive, um, when in fact he was just kind of a prankster and he was just among his hacker friends just trying to prove you know, that he could kind of hack into more complicated systems. Um, anyway, uh, so from there, I uh, was kind of, you know, really thinking about this idea of the hacker, and I really wanted to connect it um, in a lot of different ways to um, the idea of the artist. And I had this kind of basic working thesis in my head that maybe where artists had lost their subversive potential and culture, that maybe the hacker was the figure who now had this subversive potential, and I wanted to think about that. So when I research for an exhibition, one thing that's really important to me in my practice is to look at everything from kind of really low culture to really high culture. So really theoretical things to kind of really um, pedestrian things. So the best place to search for real mass culture, I think, for me, is Pirate Bay, uh, which has come up earlier tonight. Um, 
And what you see is a screenshot um, of a torrent file that I, had, I came across when I was conducting this research about the hacker as a cultural figure. Um, and, and what I found was this really incredibly put together um, package of 15.42 gigabytes that was assembled, um, as you see here, the screen name, um, by a person who was only known to me as Pirate Turk. Um, and so I downloaded this, and I was really interested in seeing what, what, what files would be in this. And it was kind of vaguely described as a collection of various movies depicting hacker culture and computer culture. Um, and what I found when I downloaded it was this completely amazing collection that was like so carefully curated. And it spanned everything from like real kind of Hollywood style representations of the hacker to more documentaries about uh, the subject to kind of um, materials that had been produced inside hacking communities themselves. And I got really invested in the kind of curatorial labor that had gone into this. I really respected it. Um, and I kind of wanted, maybe want to do something with this material in a certain way. But then I thought, you know, well, how, you know, I've just found this thing that someone, some anonymous person has assembled. You know, how can I mobilize this? How can I, you know, do something with this when already, you know, I think kind of questions of authorship are at stake in just releasing this as a file on Pirate Bay. So what I decided to do was I decided that it would be interesting to um, set up a series of screenings where this content could be um, seen in a public. Um, and what I did is instead of calling myself the curator of this project, I uh, called Pirate Turk the curator of this project. Of course, I don't know who Pirate Turk is, and uh, I have no idea whether he or she would be interested in this gesture, but I thought, well, fair, fair enough, they should be named as the person who's the, the curator of this series. And then I kind of understood my role as more an organizer, that I would bring Pitch's idea to an art institution, and I would um, be interested in kind of showing these movies in public. So these are just a kind of a few screenshots, so you get the ambiance of, of this collection. This is a really cheesy Hollywood 90s movie called Hackers, uh, 1980s movie called War Games, um, The Net, this is a, called The Pirates of Silicon Valley. This is a documentary about how microprocessors are made. This is news footage um, of the kind of free Kevin protest that the whole name and idea of the project is alluding to. So I um, showed this as a screening um, at Art in General. Um, and we also kind of made a series of books that kind of complemented it. The context of um, the space that it was screened in was a kind of library project. I was really interested in thinking about situating this in a library project because at least in American law, uh, libraries have a lot more leeway to share things and to make things copied and available than other spaces. Um, but really, for me, you know, I started to get really interested in thinking about how could I take this project and make it into something that would be along the lines of like an open source model of curating. What would that mean? What would that look like? What would that be? So what I decided to do was to kind of um, attend to a future life of the project by suggesting that anyone, in fact, could have these materials. I would give them any kind of advice, research that I had collected, and I would really allow anyone to make this screening for themselves anywhere in the world that they wanted to. So this was a version of it that happened in Amsterdam. This is a version that happened in Stockholm, um, and it circulated to a number of places. Um, and so, then I kind of moved on from there to starting to think more seriously about um, the context of art. I mean, I guess one thing that I should mention about the Free Kevin project that was really interesting for me is that even though this was a project that I carried out in an art space and it had pretty much only been like, you know, announced in a kind of art oriented press in the United States, that the people who showed up to the screening were almost had nothing to do with art. <laughs> there were people who were Creative Commons activists, there were people who were like computer repair people, there were people who were like really interested in this culture on another level. And that for me was actually one of the most interesting things about the project that I, I felt like I could use the context of art to sort of expand, you know, who would want to participate in these ideas and think about them. Um, and I, but then I kind of got interested in thinking harder about 
well, why, why weren't there artists there? Why don't artists feel any particular affinity to this set of ideas? Um, and so at the same time, I was approached by uh, an artist named David Horowitz, and he was at that time about to graduate from an MFA program um, in the United States at Bard College. And he was, um, he kind of knew that I was doing some projects that circulated around these questions of intellectual property in various ways, and he said, let's do a project together with the graduating class from the MFA program. And I said, okay. Uh, and so we started to, I, then I got interested in hearing more about what their education was like. I didn't know that much about it. Um, and he kind of explained it as this sort of utopian place where, you know, you would just make work and talk about it all day long. But one thing that I thought was interesting in his description that it seemed really absent that people, you know, people weren't trained to think about what it would mean that, you know, the moment they graduated, they would step into a kind of professional art world where there would be a really different set of questions and demands about what they made and how it would be commodified. Um, so I asked him if he would be interested in doing a project where we would ask every member of the of this class to donate a work to the public domain, um, which he thought was a good idea. So we uh, wrote a letter to everyone, um, and people submitted work. Um, and what we decided to do, what this first slide is of actually, is, a, is of a, it, this is a public library in the town next to where the school was located, and we asked the public library if they would be willing to become a depository for these artworks that were put into the public domain. And by public domain, what I basically mean is um, we used a kind, of, a kind of Creative Commons license, which is to, to put something directly into the public domain, which means that you immediately relinquish all of your interest and ownership over it, that it's, it's free from copyright, um, and that anyone can use or adapt the work in any way we see fit. And then kind of giving it to, over to the library was this gesture of thinking about this public structure and this public institution that could care for these works and would have the um, kind of infrastructure to take care of them over time. Uh, and then from there, I started to think that um, that while these projects were really interesting for me, and I learned a lot from doing them, that I started to become really a little bit more cynical. I think this was a time, this was in 2009, I guess, when you know it seemed increasingly clear that the sort of utopian idea of free culture that um, had the internet had going on for a long time, that was kind of fading away. And that you could increasingly see the internet as a super kind of corporate structure that was interested in kind of free culture as something it could exploit and use for its on its own terms. And I just the most schematic and obvious example of this is something like Facebook, I think. Um, you know, where you're giving your kind of content, you're sharing things, but actually, you know, they're interested in having you there so that they can take the data that you generate and sell that to an advertising agency and make an enormous profit off of that. So I started to think that it was time to kind of delve deeper into these ideas. I didn't want to just aestheticize them. I mean, I was trying to really think critically about them, but I wanted to take that kind of thinking to another level. So um, I started a project together with an artist named Marisha Lewandowska, and we decided to kind of just embark on a long-term research project around art and intellectual property. We didn't know exactly what that meant or where it would take us. We had both been interested in these ideas in different ways, her in her artistic practice, me in my curatorial practice, um, but we kind of just wanted to sit down together and start to think about these things in a sustained way. So uh, the project, you know, over time started to really explore the relationship between artistic practice, legal structures, open culture, and the public realm in different ways. Um, and one of the very first kind of um, outcomes of this research project that we were doing together um, happened at the showroom in London. And, uh, you know, we were, I was, it was a time when I was really interested in thinking about how models of property ownership and power relationships and the boundary between public and private were quietly and not so quietly being redrawn inside the knowledge economy. But I felt like I needed to kind of think about these ideas um, with other people. So what we decided to do was we decided to just assemble um, a small and modest discussion group. This was a kind of private initiative. Um, it wasn't open to the public. 
Um, and we tried to just assemble a group of people that spanned a lot of different kind of um, stakes in these questions. So artists were there, curators, theorists, lawyers, galleries, academics. Um, and these were all people who had one way or another dealt with these questions in their practice. Um, and so from this, we kind of generated this, what you see is a sort of documentation of the conversation that we found evolving. And kind of, you know, how we started the event was just to kind of put some very basic and broad questions on the table for discussion. And I'll just quickly read those to you now so you have some idea of the context. Who owns information and knowledge? What are the contemporary conditions, politics, and economies of its production, circulation, and distribution? What are the terms on which it should be shared, both inside the art context and beyond it? How have the possibilities of digital technologies, network culture, and access to global means of distribution put pressure on such ideas? How can we contextualize the growing number of artists, artworks, projects, essays, and exhibitions which seek to address the role of intellectual property? How can the art institution be a productive site for critique or activism with regards to open culture? So, uh, I mean, I, I would say a really great sort of conversation emerged out of this, and um, one of the kind of basic ideas that came up in this discussion was, um, well, maybe we should make a book about these ideas. Um, but there was a lot of disagreement among the group about what it would mean to make a book. Because a book, of course, um, you know, it becomes a public object, but it's also, you know, a kind of private initiative. It becomes owned in very conventional ways. Um, and, you know, when you have this possibility to publish things online, you know, choosing the form of a book, I think, means a specific set of things. And we wanted to think about that. So uh, from there, um, I worked together with Marisha on a project that we presented um, at Bard College at the Center for Curatorial Studies Museum there. And this was a project um, where I think I had really, you know, this idea of thinking through the concept of the book started to really get to me. I wanted to understand what kind of possibilities of distribution, what, what, what did the objectness of a book kind of mean in contemporary culture when you have the availability to share ideas and knowledge in many different ways. Um, and in fact, uh, Marisha and I, she was based in London at that time, and I was in New York, so almost all of our sharing looks like this. This was a Dropbox folder of um, all kinds of text that we collected online and shared together that had to do with these issues and that we were spending time discussing. And I was, you know, I kept thinking, well, you know, what is an interesting way to make these things public, to make these discussions public? It's not okay to kind of let them reside in, in the realm of privateness. So we installed them, we took them, we printed out the PDFs, we hung them up on the wall, we added some books, um, photographs, and it, it really just became a, a library where people were asked to kind of really contemplate the ideas of intellectual property in different ways. And I thought it was really kind of meaningful to have this in the space of a museum. Um, and furthermore, a museum that's embedded inside an educational institution, and not to mention an extremely expensive private educational institution, um, to try and kind of think about maybe how we, what are the terms of sharing um, that we're invested in. So from there, uh, Marisha and I started to work on a kind of interview text we, where we did a conversation with one another. Um, and the idea from the start was to make a text that we would designate from the start could be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, transmitted by any means, electronic, mechanical, photocopying, recording, or otherwise, without prior permission of the publisher or authors. So that's a statement that reverses the typical thing that your book says inside it that you're not allowed to do. But we were interested in generating a text that, from the start, that would be how it was understood, that it should kind of be distributed through all those means. Um, and it was published, as you see here, this is a cover for um, a publication that was put together by the Royal College of Art. There's graduating students um, who, in the curatorial studies program there. Um, but the text has interestingly had many other lives because of this ability to kind of be open to free circulation. So it's also been translated into Swedish and into Polish and published in many other contexts. Um, and I really liked this idea of this kind of distributed, distributive form of publication. And then this, I think, again, 
sort of returned us to this question of um, how to make a book or why to make a book um, to circulate, you know, to think about the circulation of ideas in that way. But that brings us more or less to the present, um, and this is um, the place that I work now, hence the Clums Hall. Um, and uh, I was asked to kind of come up with a series of events that would relate to Marisha and I's um, interest in these questions around intellectual property. Um, so what we decided to do was to put together a program called Publishing and Process, Ownership in Question. And the idea would be from the start that we would decide that we were going to make a book publication together but that um, what we wanted to do was to use this series of events as a kind of testing ground for that. Um, and so um, to really think about um, the relationship of public and private that the art world itself proposes, to think about the construction of narratives of property, ownership, exchange, and value inside the mechanisms of the art world. Um, and to really, you know, think about the people who would then be invited to participate in these series, both the lecturers and the audience, as really, um, really invest in them as kinds of collaborators and kind of just wait and see what would come out of this negotiation of these public events and how would that lead to the future publication of a book. Um, and so uh, what we did was we invited um, a number of people to a series of events that just started in February, and it will continue once a month until May. Um, and so the first guest that we had um, in February was Florian Schneider, who spoke on property. Antonia Hirsch, who talked about it, who will talk about exchange in her event, which happens um, on March 22nd. And then Marina Vishnit on property in April, and Matthew Stedler on ownership in May. Um, and, you know, I guess um, I also wanted to use this event series and the idea of making this book uh, as a way to really revisit some old terms that I know come with a lot of baggage, but to really wonder if we could start to reuse them in a fresh way and to think about the contemporary context as one, as, as one in which their definitions really, I think, we feel to be in flux now. And uh, one thing that you know, I was kind of really reflecting on a lot of the political situations happening in many parts of the world, and I really kind of started to feel that there was this basic contestation of the question, you know, the difference between what is privately owned in society versus publicly shared. This seems to me a basic thread that you could bring through a lot of different things happening in the world in the Occupy movements um, happening in New York and many other places in the world. I could see it in the European debt crisis. So this is, these are some questions that are at stake um, in the Arab Spring and the Chilean winter and a lot of different struggles. I think these are kind of foundational things that we're starting to question now that the effects of neoliberal capitalism has sort of been allowed to um, you know, firmly implement itself in, in many cultures. Um, so I guess just to give a little bit of context to um, the series of events and this idea of imagining a future book together. So um, I'm going to just read you from a really nice statement that my collaborator Marisha uh, wrote that kind of contextualizes the idea of publishing as we're interested in it here. So she says, the emphasis of the project is to bring our attention to publishing as a conceptual and physical site for debates concerning the relationship between ownership and a need for public access and engagement. Historically, it was printing and publishing the prevailing technologies of the second half of the 18th century through which the need for regulation and protection was introduced, giving rise to copyright law. Giving rise to copyright law. 300 years later, we are experiencing a very different motivation for enforced enclosure brought about by strictly commercial interests, which are very far removed from the emancipatory potential of our digital age. Our project takes inspiration from current thinkers and artists to whom the question of intellectual participation is profoundly invested in the means through which they reach the public. Publishing in its more extended sense becomes a site of articulation as well as construction of the public. It is a site of exchange of different modalities of production 
attending to performances, conversations, seminars, and printed matter. It gives us an opportunity for creating a common platform capable for supporting emergent practices. The book ensures the visibility of collaborative process and reflexively engages with questions of its own production, ownership, and distribution. Through creating a dynamic between public events and the publication of the book itself, we are att attempting to relocate and disperse the institutional exhibition space into a wider public realm. We see in the act of publishing a potential for instigating a critically based social endeavor. So the project kind of takes up three different modes, um, and I would say each of these come with their own specific conditions and tactics for the distribution of knowledge and the construction of the public. Um, the events themselves kind of take up the form and the rubric of a seminar, and then there's the publication itself, which will be in the form of a book, which is an object. But we've also um, made negotiations with the publisher that we will work with um, that explicitly state that we feel that this also has to be available for free online circulation. So the kind of website as another mode or site. Um, and I guess, um, you know, this is what it looks like to put the model of the seminar into the, into the console, into the space of exhibition space that art offers us. Um, and I, you know, I, I guess I started to feel like um, a little bit critical of sort of the exhibition model in and of itself in terms of how it positions me in relationship to objects and property, I think there are a lot of problems with that. So um, I've tried to slowly over time become a curator who almost never wants to touch or work with objects um, to try and get around that problem maybe. Um, but I've also become really attractive, attracted to the idea of doing something really demanding and that is absolutely not entertainment inside the space of the Kunst Hall. So um, the idea of kind of mobilizing the, the idea of the seminar is that people come prepared to have a really kind of difficult discussion about ideas. Um, and so we thought that we should start the evening by actually serving people soup and bread and wine. And I think in that gesture was an idea that, you know, we should attend generously to these audiences because we truly understand them as collaborators. Um, and every table had a microphone on it so that, of course, everyone was equally um, allowed to sort of speak and interrupt and um, to have the same kind of presence of voice as the speaker themselves. Um, and so this is a uh, Florian Schneider's back. <laughs> um, and this is uh, a clip that I just want to show you. It's just a five minute clip from his contribution. Um, and I think that that will be the end of my presentation, and then we can kind of open up for questions from there. But I thought that Florian brought up some really interesting ideas and what he had to say. We basically uh, invited him to present based on um, a project that he's worked on for some years, a research project called Imaginary Property. And uh, it kind of starts from this question, what does it mean to own an image today? Um, and so we kind of thought he would be a really great person to sort of unpack the idea of what property means. He's also, I mean, he's a really interesting guy with a kind of incredible background. He was trained as a documentary filmmaker, but he's worked as a theorist, as a curator, um, and he's also kind of had um, a lot of, uh, he was really early, early interested in online culture. Um, so he kind of can span a lot of different perspectives, and I think that really informs what you will hear him say. Interesting. So, um, these moments of immaterialization are by no means something that is very specific to the uh, to our contemporary uh, situation. Yeah? Um, this happens over and over again. Um, the result, I mean, but it, it appears as, as a crisis of value insofar as value is considered not to be quantifiable and measurable anymore. And the response is a kind of uh, re reinforcement of a new kind of regime uh, or a new kind of division of labor that reorganizes the labor, the, 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 that reorganizes the labor process uh, in a way that um, knowledge um, is expropriated um, uh, under 
under the regime of, 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 of capital. This is the, this is the kind of um, uh, immaterialization that takes place over and over again. Yeah? And in different, uh, in, I think, in different uh, and very significant uh, uh, moments of uh, the history of uh, capitalism over and over again. What we're experiencing today um, is another kind of these crises of measurability um, in the end. And there will be, um, of course, under the slogan of uh, uh, creative industries, yeah, there will be, I um, uh, don't think we need um, a lot of fantasy uh, for this, there will be new forms of um, re-quantifying and measuring again uh, this kind of um, um, uh, immaterial labor or effective labor um, that is, for example, um, characterizing what we are doing in uh, the context of, um, of the art world. Yeah? I mean, in a certain way, this is a laboratory um, to generate and uh, to, uh, to, to rediscuss uh, um, uh, new forms of, of, of measurement. In a certain way, um, uh, we are in a certain we are um, um, in a very schizophrenic situation. That on one hand we are participating in this. Yeah, I mean we are trying. I mean, who does not want to make artworks more participatory, more interactive, uh, and more accessible? Yeah. In the end, what we are doing is generating exactly the kind of knowledge that is needed um, in order to uh, re reinforce uh, quantification of measurement again. So the question for me, and I mean, maybe this could be, um, uh, could be some kind of, uh, not really conclusions here, but uh, uh, three points of, uh, of, of uh, that I think the, a discussion about uh, what needs to be done or what, what is to be done today um, should should be um, yeah, kind of uh, influenced um, by um, how do we deal or um, how, how do we deal with this imaginary character um, of, of property or with um, at the same time um, the ongoing what or the, the, the tendency of images that become more and more um, subject to uh, property relations. Um, I think on one hand um, it is all about um, uh, multiplying and uh, really challenging uh, the imaginary character of property. Um, I think this is necessary on a very pragmatic and uh, on a very concrete level, uh, not so much on a conceptual level. I think on, on a conceptual level, uh, quite a lot of possibilities have been uh, uh, have been explored. Yeah? Um, I think on a, um, on a on a on a very pragmatic level to uh, figure out uh, what could be new and ever more imaginary, ever more immaterial uh, forms of ownership. Yeah? That, uh, uh, that can be that can be multiplied. Um, so I mean I'm I don't think it is very uh, it is very helpful at the moment if uh, all artists would agree that uh, the Creative Commons license is fine. Yeah. So let's put this label under every artwork and then uh, we establish this wonderful uh, new space of the commons where everything can be shared and uh, uh, exchanged freely. Yeah? I think in order to indeed subvert and attack uh, the concept of, uh, of, of imaginary property, um, uh, we have to we have to over affirm it in a certain way yeah? and find out about new and uh, completely different models of ownership. All there. I think that will give us plenty to talk about. Thank you for listening. Does anybody have any questions? Comments? Uh, 
thanks for your speech, it was very, very interesting. And uh, you mentioned that, this, uh, uh, that banks use a kind of uh, playground to test uh, some of the production. Uh, it was really interesting and made me think about the uh, Mendler's pure economy uh, concept or more accurately uh, Christian Fuchs' uh, law of natural capitalism. But then this antagonistic dualism uh, between competition and uh, cooperation or uh, property and uh, participation and uh, give them the economy, etc. Then uh, I think also we can put this duality between the user, labor, or prosumer, as you just uh, mentioned with Facebook and uh, this user commodity of uh, internet. Uh, it's very interesting. That art is a uh, niche, uh, but which perspective uh, art can uh, give us about all this, all this new uh, shift? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a great question. I would say that is the fundamental question that I struggle with at the moment. Um, I think over time, doing more and more projects in the context of art, I start to worry or wonder. And I think Florian Schneider kind of puts it so perfectly. You know, what you know by having this conversation, what what is what actually does that produce? I mean, I'm really interested in art and culture because I believe very much in the free exchange of ideas. I really appreciate having a forum to kind of talk about these things, to have a public to have a discussion. Um, but of course, who owns that discussion, I think, is a serious question, and who mobilizes that discussion in what ways to what ends is something that um, it worries me, and I, I want to attend to it carefully, but I think at the moment I feel I have a lot more questions than I have answers, unfortunately. Well, I found his comments just now very interesting because he was speaking so much about measurability. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, measurability is sort of one side of a coin and on the other side is consent, you know, because as new measurements are developed, we, we then have to sort of agree on them in order to hold them dear. So, you know, the metric system and other systems and, and all of this and page views versus eyeballs versus, you know, uh, hits. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways we're in a time where Measurements are being recalibrated, and uh, you know that, that there there's a great deal of dissent rather than consent. Um, and I guess you know, and also a time in which like the sort of end user license agreement is sort of the new bill of rights or something. And so I guess I wonder if that's an interesting, if that's a topic that interests you moving forward. You know, as these things are sort of being hashed out, the idea of dissent or or sort of consent in, in the digital space is interesting, and, and what you might, what your thoughts might be. Yeah, no, I think that raises a lot of really interesting things to talk about. I mean, one thing I will say about this kind of equation of free, as I think that um, in the spirit that Joseph is mobilizing it for us to talk about, is you know what I find to be very problematic about the idea of free is that it proposes that we're all agreeing to, to have a certain kind of exchange, but then it separates you from all the damaging parts of that exchange that maybe you click a button and say, because you didn't want to read through 20 pages of legal like language, okay, but I don't believe that we've actually consented. And I think that um, you know we're kind of in this moment where the concept of value is trying to be put into crisis Exactly, so we don't really know what we're agreeing to. We don't really understand what we're consenting to. And I, I do think this will get ironed out in the future. I think we'll start to understand and grasp those things, I hope, with more clarity. But I think a lot of changes have happened in such a short amount of time, and we're really just taking stock of what those were. Um, and I think, you know, this uh, rehearse an old argument that capitalism likes to mobilize crisis to change the terms of things. And I think that in digital culture, that's precisely what we've been seeing happening. Hey, I'm interested in how, um, like, uh, this power structure can shift 
within this concept, I think context, because it's I think the most important part to all of these questions. What are your thoughts about that? Can you say more about what you understand of this con context? This context what, is yeah. like, uh, since we're speaking about the internet basically and how each individual has this platform uh, equally with, the, with, another, with one another. So, um, besides all this capital that's being invested on the internet and all these companies taking advantage of this, there is a platform where everyone is equal to one another. So this creates another power dynamic or authority uh, concept that's uh, so this might have this possibility to change the, the flow of information but also the gains and you know the, the the capital I mean it should change with the idea of the power and being empowered by the use of this kind of platform equally. Yeah. So that's I mean I guess I would say that I was like very a very early to be excited person about the internet on the terms that I really, you know, I think we have to go back and remember that suddenly there was a platform where anyone could publish anything and that that was a mode of it felt very much like it was challenging accepting it, it like established power structures in that way. Um, but what I feel has really happened over time is that while we still have access to that platform and while um, it's true that it proposes a, maybe a radically different model of participation than other kinds of publishing or public platforms that we've had in the past. But I think that behind the scenes, what's really changed is all different kinds of rules and regulations and enclosures. So that it's really hard for me to, to although I really once was super optimistic about the potential of this medium to change something, I really feel like I'm in a totally different place about this question now. Um, just watching things like the legislation like ACTA, which is being considered, and there are all these mechanisms kind of happening behind what we see in digital culture. Um, this is another kind of aspect of Flora Schneider's argument that you didn't see in the clip, but he had this really interesting kind of theorization of metadata, which is um, what all the kinds of things that you put online kind of uh, generate this um, uh, this invisible layer of, of data, more or less. Um, and he says what's really interesting is that met this metadata model, what it says is that content is completely split from metadata, right? So there's this divide. So when I put something on Facebook, what I think I'm doing is sharing a picture with my friends, but this other operation is totally quietly happening that I don't even have to think about or see on any level. And I think it's like that kind of split and all of the things that become invisibilized but are able to be tracked, that become data that can be measured. I think this is where I feel a really kind of increasingly pessimistic view of what can be made possible. But I think it does really, I mean one thing that the struggle to understand these things has made me feel very attuned to is how much structures like politics and the law underpin these questions that ultimately affect us in, in the realm of culture at the end of the day. Um, and I think that those are the kind of layers and levels on which things actually need to shift and change for a medium like this to have potential and that we have to maybe put our energy in attending to how to keep those structures open in a true and sincere way um, on the level of maybe politics or activism as opposed to just you know, uploading everything that we have online for free. Comments, uh, just uh, make, make something about. Uh, we always said this uh, decentralized uh, environment, is, uh, but as you mentioned, there's a kind of super centralized mm -hmm. uh, movement to like cloud computing, for example. Yeah, uh, exactly. yeah cloud computing is corporately uh, all the space and controlled space and uh, much more performant, etc. But uh, use cloud computing as Wikileaks did it. 
uh, Amazon Web Services just uh, shut you down uh, with the pressure of the uh, United States government. Uh, just an example. Uh, you, you make me, uh, for example, just just, just uh, manage a kind of uh, citizen media environment on the cloud, and uh, you criticize a big client of Amazon Web Services, and they shut you down. Uh, they need it needs a kind of new legal environment because it's not only freedom of expression, also, but it's also freedom of co commerce, uh, just uh, it's, it's at stake very neoliberal uh, freedom. Then uh, it's not uh, clear at all why I think uh, art uh, perception can be helpful for, to, to rule this kind of things, to comprehend this kind of things. Because in the art there is this uh, subversive uh, transforming uh, energy that uh, we need art uh, to, to interest more and more in this uh, Living area, as uh, you know, the network. The question is just a comment. I just wanted to comment on uh, what you said towards the end of the talk regarding the uh, you just don't want to touch the objects and that seminars and so on and so forth. Um, in a way, what if we take the title of the series, Features and Options, seriously and think of what they are, they're derivatives, right? And derivatives don't necessarily really touch the object. Yeah. Um, so you don't actually need to have an object to derive a profit from something. Totally, yeah. And therefore, in a way, um, as long as there is actually a uh, signifier that collects the um, you know, sort of, I don't want to say surplus technically because economics, uh, as an economist, I won't call it surplus appropriate, but it's a secondary yeah. cut from the surplus. Yeah. In the sense that, you know, sort of, in a way, regardless of the art uh, process itself, uh -huh. um, that could be value. And a kind of skimming of that. Yeah. So, so, um, so in that sense, uh, it is. Uh, but you know, in a, way, in a way, I want to say this because it is there. It's in front of us. Yeah. It takes for title for that. But on the other hand, you know, sort of, I also understand the uh, uh, double-edgedness of the situation. That is. Yeah. Having uh, an evening of communication and reading something is a unique experience. And to be able to product, produce that, so there is actually a surplus that you're producing there, perhaps, yeah. say, a meaning and knowledge and, and togetherness. Which, uh, to do that, you're giving a little bit of your surplus to the so called, you know, whatever the institution that you are, or yeah. for. We are producing something here, and we're giving a little bit of surplus to signify right. that whole is together. Right. So it's just that that's perhaps we have to separate the uh, class process that's happening among us with what we're paying as a tax or a rent, uh, in not in the form of monetary, but other forms of N pi or F8 or something like that. Right. So just a comment. Yeah, no, thank you for putting that so much more eloquently <laughs> than I was able to. I mean, I think that's exactly what I'm interested in. And, um, and I appreciate your pointing to that as a tension, too, because that's really what I think it is. <clears throat> I want to ask question um, related to that latest comment, um, don't you think that especially in the context of the uh, confined space of the gallery or the artist talk you know, being done in such spaces or the space from you know, probably in Germany, I don't know, uh, the expectation uh, from the art to produce an answer against neoliberal policies is itself commodified in that uh, 
space and how uh, this commodification actually, in a way, shapes the uh, debate itself and how do they interact that the result of this commodification and uh, the process itself, do you think? And, uh, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question. Um, I guess the way I try and account for those things is I try to practice as a curator in a way that I feel tries to be conscientious of embodying the same things that I'm trying to address. So that the form and the content have to bear a kind of relationship to one another. Um, I think I try as much as I can to kind of thoughtfully attend to that, to feel like um, you know, if I'm going to talk about ideas of um, collaboration and, you know, these kinds of things that or shared authorship or, you know, how can we question ownership, then I really have to do it on very practical levels inside my practice in every way. So, I mean, I guess, um, it, you know, there's tons of examples of ways in which um, every project I make, I try to make everything that results from it free and available for circulation. I mean, whether or not that gets you out of this kind of problem is maybe another question. But I guess, I don't know, I feel like having a form of sincerity in what you do is maybe the best way to try and counteract some of these problematics. So that's kind of the sincerity. I also like, really like awkwardness, because awkwardness doesn't yet seem to be very commodifiable. <laughs> um, and naivete, I think. But I think those are the kind of three ways I try to go about that. May I also refute my question with uh, commenting that isn't, for example, from another perspective, isn't it a certain paranoia that we uh, are uh, compelled to develop about uh, these critic uh, criticizing neoliberal policies, presuming that it covers everything, or are we already paranoid about that we are already uh, uh, taken by? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I feel like I'm not just thinking about neoliberal policies. I mean, I for me, I feel like um, you know why I want to practice things this way comes from a very specific actual set of class relations and a very specific set of instances around these questions which have affected me for my entire life. And, you know, I think that um, the New York City art world, which is the one until recently that I've been the most familiar with, um, it's really messed up on the level of class and who can participate and what does it mean to sponsor something and who gets credit for what and how galleries work and how they exploit people's labor. All of these questions are super real to me. So I guess I'm, and I, yeah, I mean, I think there's a kind of level of theoretical discourse that um, we're trying, I'm trying to kind of stay aware of and maybe art is tiring of thinking that it can actually attend to that um, in a way. But I think we can't forget that we're actually talking about human social relationships that are at stake. Um, and we have to just foreground that and pay attention to it as much as we can. And I don't know if that really is a, is a good response to what you're saying, but it was what it brings to mind. Yeah, I think Okay, I think we're just going to end it right there so everyone can continue smoking. Um, thank you very much, Laurel, for your presentation. I really appreciate it.